are going towards our next session. Our next session is a panel discussion. This is going to be an interesting discussion on reinventing marketing ROI, blending branding and performance. Now, I would like all of you to join me as I welcome and introduce our speakers on the panel to all of you. I'd like to invite our session chair, Ms. Reena Mishra, Senior Partner, Microsoft Advertising. Our panelist, Ms. Rubina Singh, CEO, iProspect. Ms. Elizabeth Venkataraman, Joint President, Consumer, Commercial and Wealth Marketing, Kotak Mahindra Bank. Mr. Praval Singh, Vice President, Marketing, Zoho. Shreyansh Modi, Head of Performance Marketing, Flipkart. And last but not the least, Mr. Prasad Shrijare, Founder and CEO, Logic Serve. So very warm welcome to all our panelists on screen and thank you for joining us today. And I'd like Reena to please take over the proceedings for the panel discussion. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, welcome all. I feel extremely delighted uh, to host a panel of thought leaders uh, of this industry today. Uh, so welcome to all the panel members. Uh, uh, of course, Rohit has already kind of given an introduction on the search report. So I would highly suggest that you could go and refer it at some point of time. It's extremely insightful. And uh, just starting the discussion. Uh, so we all know that uh, leadership plays a very important role in today's time because we look at a leader because their role is to drive innovation. They kind of recognize and they uh, create a lot of opportunities. But for a lot of us, uh, leadership is like a North Star and we kind of look at them when we are kind of looking for some kind of a perspective on the world. We know that the dynamics of the market are ever changing. And this calls uh, once in a while for us to reevaluate our goals and see, do, are we still relevant? So with that thought, I will jump into the discussion, which is reinventing marketing hardware, blending branding and performance. And let's, let's hear from this August panel. So my first question is to Rubina. Uh, hi, Rubina. Uh, iProspect has established itself as an expert, digital first end-to-end -end agency which is known in the market for their expertise in the uh, financial sector. And my question to you is that, do you think the line between branding and performance is blurring for, for brands from a marketing perspective? No, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, we are at a stage today where, uh, you know, uh, both branding as well as performance are really coming together. They are really intersecting. I think that ecosystem where uh, branding and performance could be bought separately in siloed and work uh, has gone long past, you know, because uh, let's really look at it. Uh, you know, we need to think of the consumer in the center and then plan our media and connect the media around that. And what we need to do is, you know, um, use all the capabilities that we have from understanding uh, a brand to be able to do strategic planning, to be able to do marketing uh, activation as well as uh, you know, performance optimization. And I think uh, where the magic really happens is where you're able to um, you know, um, uh, uh, understand the ever-changing human behavior and human truths and find those pivotal intersects between um, culture, content, uh, data, and technology. And that's where you need to use your experience and bring it all together and uh, bring it to life. And once you're able to do that, I think that's where you can truly uh, you know, help uh, brands accelerate. So what I really think is that you've got to align yourself towards the, uh, you know, business goals, marketing goals, keeping the consumer in the center, and of course, uh, get rid of these silos of branding and performance. Yeah, thanks, Rubina. I do believe that, you know, like I said, think of the consumer first is totally relevant. I mean, we can never lose focus of that. And I like that whole thing about, spoke about the magic, which is the amalgamation of your culture, content, data, and tech. So thanks a lot for that. Uh, my question uh, is to Elizabeth. Uh, so Kotak Mahindra Bank is building tools to enable villages and connecting them on the digital platform. So it means that there'll be more customers that will be kind of coming on platform. So from the BFSI sector, I wanted to ask you, how does it look for the brands in that sector? Is the line, according to you, beginning to blur like between the branding and performance metrics? 
I think that uh, your uh, one of the big initiatives which are you know being announced now is National Agricultural Market ENAM. So what that it's a good example to uh, you know discuss it with. So what happens there is it's an online trading platform for uh, to trade in agricultural commodities, and this will actually bring all stakeholders together whether it's a farmer, whether it's a trader and other organizations like the APMC, the Agri Mondays and all of it to uh, digitize transactions. Uh, what it really means is the farmer will be able to trade on the platform. I mean, you know, sell his produce or her produce on the platform and get money into his or her bank account. And that's really, a, the vision is really to digitize to uh, you know, uh, to do real time price discovery, to build a very transparent, robust uh, system where they all come into formal financial services. So it can be uh, significant. These kind of initiatives can be significant to uh, you know to to connect with uh, or to do uh, you know some of these initiatives in tier three to tier five towns. And, and just coming back to those towns and challenges in marketing there, it would be, uh, it, one, we'll have to go and see and we'll have to evaluate what are the changes that have happened in those towns uh, in, these, uh, in these times, uh, in the last 15 months, because the country overall has leapfrogged a, a digitally. Uh, but how have these uh, towns specifically been impacted? Now, the first round of the pandemic didn't really impact uh, these cities, they 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 held, uh, they, you know, they held themselves well. But round two has impacted them, and we we'll love to really understand. I think for a marketer, and and the challenge would be to understand these segments. And uh, you know, we have multiple products and offerings in these segments. We we, we are committed to the uh, to the vision. Uh, however, for for a marketer, it would be a challenge to understand what they have, how they have changed, how they have adapted during the pandemic. What are the new media which they have begun to use? With because in, there is increasing levels of internet penetration, etc. And then uh, you know, uh, uh, develop the campaign. So it will be a, a, a little more. It will be a differentiated, a different approach based on what kind of uh, media they are using. But early signs do show they've, I mean, you see it with even your domestic help. It is the WhatsApp usage uh, or, you know, chat usage has gone up. It was earlier, more SMS, uh, you know, and calls, but data uh, proliferation, et cetera, has also changed some of the habits. Thank you. In fact, you know, the, the wave and what the, what COVID has done to us, it is not lost on any of us how much they have really suffered. So I think the timing is just right. And I think it's great that we are cutting so many agents in between. So I think it sounds like an absolutely like an aggressive and a very uh, like a needed step that uh, the Gotek Mandra Bank is taking. Thank you for that. Uh, so now we have heard from the both sides from the BFSI sector. Now let's move on to, to understand something from the e-commerce. So Shriyans, this question is for you. Flipkart is one of the biggest brands that we know in the e-commerce space. What is the differentiation between branding and performance campaign parameters in the e-commerce space? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for the question. This is like a evergreen question. I think uh, wherever I go, I get this question for sure. So branding is in a nutshell, right? It is very, very important for anyone. Uh, any brand, right? And it depends on what life stage your brand is. Today, when we look at any of the larger brands, those brands are brands because they have spent huge amount of money onto branding, right? And it is not about uh, right away starting with performance. So for us as well, like uh, we, we do understand that branding is critical and performance is also very critical. And uh, we try and keep both separate because we don't, uh, uh, we don't want to really merge both of these together and uh, kind of dissolve the overall output of this metrics, right? So for a performance campaign when I run, right? Today, a performance campaign would get measured onto what kind of ROI do I get, right? ROI could be defined into uh, visits, visitors, customers, new acquisition, repeat acquisition, anything, right? Whereas when we run a branding campaign, you would want to really focus more towards how many customers are you able to reach out to? Are you able to create that kind of impact that a customer thinks of your brand when, when he needs a particular product, right? Your branding message would not typically uh, say that, okay, we have this product come and purchase at this price, right? But your performance product, performance ad would really look like this. So it's it's very important to measure the right metrics. So reach frequency, of course, is a 
right metric for your brand campaigns and uh, when you run performance campaigns you can probably decide like do you want to really go deeper the funnel or you want to be on the mid of the funnel where you want to stop at say measuring only visits or you want to see add to cart or you want to finally go to a purchase and then attribute all right yeah so what i'm hearing is that it's pretty much like kind of stays it doesn't really come at a crossroad it's pretty much a differentiation is like there and it's kind of clear for you to measure uh so of course it's reach and frequency for the brand campaign uh, thanks riyans uh, my my next question is to pravul so with 60 million uh, users worldwide and uh, you being present in 180 plus countries zoho has been a very strong player in the uh, software uh, b2b software and technology space the focus for zoho has always been a very strong product and user experience how does product management and the marketing align together in defining the marketing goals within your organization sure uh, thank you reena and uh, hi everyone else that's a good question and and often keeps coming up to us because uh, where we are today with uh, over 50 products and 10000 employees and growing uh, you know and and primarily serving the b2b uh, market with a very clear well defined uh, objective of uh, you know helping businesses of all sizes uh to do better at what they're doing you know across all functions hr uh, sales marketing front office back office all of that so what happens is when you are uh, running a, a, such a big ship uh, you know one thing is that's key is alignment right at both at the product level when you have 50 plus products the independent teams working on those products competing in independent markets uh, with some overlap here and there so there is alignment uh, between the product teams and at the brand level uh, at the zoho level i would say which is the key and uh, and i think all of that starts with the purpose which like i said is uh, in our case helping businesses of all sizes uh, grow and be more efficient and productive that's the premise all the software that we build uh, is built on right now if you come back to how product marketing managers and product product managers work together or product marketing as a function and product management as a function work together right uh, essentially they're both striving towards delivering more value to customers and that is why you have a customer that is how you retain a customer right and uh, sure one is definitely more customer facing than the other uh, marketers generally have more output facing roles than product managers but again they they team tag together to sort of deliver the best value and if i was to further segment into how their roles play together at zoho and i would like to believe as well as well in this industry you know it's about product manager and team you know work on creating that value by all the way from defining the product roadmap what would the product strategy how would the life cycle look like how would the releases look like all of that in terms of creating value uh, marketing teams and and product marketing managers you know they they focus on how that value can be communicated that uh, in terms of how do we position it package it price it kind of content we create how do we target how do we segment an audience uh, how do we go to market with with this thing that we are trying to sell so that's how creation of value and communication of value sits between pm and pmms and then uh, there's of course delivery you know and delivery is based on different channels so uh, you know could be branding business development field marketing social media I mean, there's so many of these channels that you know eventually other teams plug into product marketing teams and deliver right so that's sort of uh, the rough structure of how we how we operate uh, the whole machinery and of course uh, this is replicated at product levels across different products but it also sort of ties up to the brand level in terms of how we position ourselves and that's that sort of again stems back to to who we are and what we are trying to solve for right with a flavor of lot of context in terms of our own values be it around privacy or or be it around buildings everything from ground up the whole tech stack and investing in r&d those are some of the core principles that we live for and with so uh, that's sort of how the whole product and brand machinery ties in together with brand marketing product marketing field marketing all that put together yeah thanks for also in fact i mean no i that you know it's pretty much it, you have delivering you're delivering value to the customer and i think you know this is such a important thing that in today's time uh, you have to kind of really put so much of work in r&d and privacy because these are also relevant because these are actually kind of you know what eventually becomes a value to the customer so thanks a lot for that uh, moving on my next question is to prasad 
uh, Hi Prasad, with number of people actually getting uh, connected in tier two and tier three towns, we are hearing a lot of chatter about vo voice and vernacular. You know, it's like it's like uh, seen as the next big thing. Are you seeing a very scalable model of voice and vernacular that is being pitched to the client or being shared with the client? A uh, very interesting question. There are four, four or five important, I think, words that I will pick, pick it up and probably try to answer that. One is tier one, tier two, okay, location related one. You talked about voice and vernacular. And the fifth important one is the scalability. And a lot of trends had been talked, talk, we have been talking about. And I think um, uh, Rohit spoke, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, Rohit uh, gave that search in India 2021 20, trends. And many of those uh, report, yes. Okay, and many of those points have already been uh, sort of covered. But you know what? Um, what I would, uh, how would I uh, take it up is, is that as a marketer, um, uh, uh, you know, um, I, I, as a digital marketer, I would say we have we have been predicting all these changes for quite some time now, right? Okay, and um, um, yeah, I mean, a lot of lot of times we have talked about it. But the uh, the way Elizabeth talked about it, the pandemic is, has really really accentuated those predictions much, much, much faster, right? Okay, um, and the consumer change, okay? The change, the way, um, you know, we, we, we consume information, the way we work, the way we shop, the way we learn, the way we entertain, you know, everything has changed, okay? And uh, of course, digital became the center of many of these assets, as, you know, uh, aspects in digital, our digital lives, okay? And, you know, I, we, we, and I, I actually tried to, there was an interesting study that I was reading some time back. And if I really want to draw these changes, in this, you know, what they call is a longitudinal consumer pulse. Okay, many of these habits, okay, which sort of we acquired in the first two, three months in, you know, April, May, June, um, okay, they, you know, many of those are going to be step change, you know, so you go up and, you know, it's going to be there, or some of them are really going to speed up, okay, that way. Okay, now let me, uh, let me go back, uh, you know, around a year back uh, during this time. If you see uh, how the brands change, you know, because, uh, you know, all of us saw that, the, the the everything sort of came down but you know what were brand doing okay they were in this decision time they did a lot of talk about safety and empathy okay and that become the focal point of uh, messaging in, and is being continuing for a long time back right so the important thing which happened is that basically the the conversation with consumer uh, you know started becoming very 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 important okay and again if you remember i'm going to you know connect all these points later on so what's happening is that i ha it's very interesting thing that i see that uh, brands have to be sort of start thinking like a publisher now, okay? Because you know they are giving that information to the uh, to to their consume uh, consumers in on a personal and lots of stuff, right? So if I add that, okay, then what's that happening, okay? So um, uh, uh, there are a few numbers which are coming. Voice search queries in India are currently sort of growing at 270 percent per year. Uh, even though he talk about that, uh, you know, a huge amount of uh, people are converting and translating things. Okay, so as I understand, around uh, 17 billion. Huh? There are some report that I was reading some time back. 17 billion times in last year, uh, the uh, there's a translation of uh, uh, web pages happening in big languages. Okay, so we're seeing all those changes happening so rapidly. Uh, there's a very interesting question. I actually went and uh, sort of I wanted to find out what actually happened. So we went to a, a multilingual sites a company, okay, and ask them a question, you know, how, what do you see? So very interesting one. So if you see tier two May, uh, English websites grew during lockdown. For example, pre-COVID, if it was X, okay, then during the first lockdown, it became 1.3 X and later on, uh, I mean, so X to 1.3 X. So what I wanted to do is that what happened to Hindi languages, right? So if pre-COVID it was X, X number of people who were visiting Hindi language sites, during the first lockdown, it became 2.52x. And post lockdown, instead of coming to x, it came up, came down to 2.43x. Okay, it didn't come down that, right? Then I want to do no more. So what happened to tier three? Okay, so it moved from x to 2.63x four times. And post lockdown, it didn't actually come down. It became 4.84x, right? Then I wanted to know what's happening. Who's reading it? Is it only young population? So between 18 to 35, okay, uh, we have that data. Okay, we actually went and culled those data. 18 to 35, okay, we saw x to 1.87x and 2.84. Okay, so it moved that way. But for 35 plus, it moved from x to 1.73 and 2.99. So if you see the way all that movement that we have seen from 400 million to around 700 million uh, internet users in this country, okay, that growth is coming 
from this tier two tier three across the group and uh, across the age group as well as uh, indic more now if you remember i talked about that you know the conversation one if, if if that group is going to talk about or they want to know more about it they converse what they are comfortable with is the voice okay because you know brands want to be really behave like a publisher and communicate with the consumer okay if i put this okay then it's a story you ask me the fifth word that uses scale scale is if you see this much of a growth i mean there is absolutely no a question about scale we are seeing a, a you know scale a lot how the brands are going to use it is the question i mean is the question are there enough people or is the question are there enough people reached okay it's a, in, in it falls in the purview of brand then i would say there is a huge amount of scale it's just that you know uh, brands need to uh, sort of go after that okay so from that 400 million to 700 million in tier 2 and tier 3 uh, you know uh, uh, converting there in indic language in conversing in you know want to converse and in, in in voice so that's what i probably saw yeah you know thank you i just a quick follow up on that so what are the technology the solutions that your clients are looking to invest are you, are you hearing something from the clients side that yeah yeah multiple of those okay the first few months about very simple one is how, how quickly i translate and all that okay so which happened it's, it's like it's earlier one okay uh, but you know what um, uh, if i if i go ahead and if i taking those all now 9 10 11 months have happened the lot of people who are really talking and this is some of the implementation we are also doing is is that all that conversational voice technologies ai based okay which is definitely uh, people are exper experimenting with uh, and there is a very interesting one okay there are a lot of dialect based also you okay, know how your bot ai bot will understand the dialects okay that's something which i definitely looking for um, i mean i'm, I'm ex experiencing a, a lot on that uh, apart from that i think um, i definitely um, Uh, from tier two, tier three, and the technology perspective, many different channels which are coming up. Formats are something we've been very, uh, very much being discussed on. A lot of conversational formats of ads. Okay, because this is the pe these are the people. Okay, who got exposed directly? They they leapfrog from one to another. The the formats they were looking earlier, they are going to change. So a lot of technologies are coming around that audience is something which will happen a lot and especially with I know I'm not going to talk about third party cookies today but you know the, how all that plays around with audiences and formats and you know voice and AI um, uh, and you know what if I really wear the academic cap uh, we are in midst of so many parameters changing and it's a very fluxy situation that way but. A lot of technologies are getting discussed and probably getting implemented. It's going to be very interesting in next three to uh, three to six months. Yeah, it's yeah. been very really, very really exciting. Uh, thanks a lot for that insight. I think amazing numbers. It does look like that marketers have to kind of really kind of come together and kind of make sure that they are not losing this audience. Just to kind of give a little insight, I think even in Microsoft side, tech stack, I'm hearing a lot of conversation where the enterprise uh, is building a lot of B2B solutions for our clients based on uh, voice and vernacular. So moving on, uh, I have a question on the same thing uh, uh, to Elizabeth. uh considering the inroads that is being made and what we have heard right now or uh, to connect with small towns and villages how is the banking industry looking at incorporating voice and vernacular in their marketing strategies right i think uh, first we'll approach it from where the customer is so you see that uh, customers uh, are increasingly sending voice notes uh you get it even from your nariyal pani wala you get it even from your maid or you get it even from your driver so they that's the first sign right they are they are comfortable uh using it so uh that's that's a good sign uh, you're also you, you know the fact that literacy may or you know may or may not be prevalent will therefore uh, you know be very very important voice will be very very important for these towns because uh, you know it will not depend on whether you can really um, uh, write or even read or uh, you know maybe a little bit of uh, uh, that can be uh, you know overcome with this uh, technology so i think it's a very very important uh, from the tier you know tier 3 to tier 5 uh, where some of these challenges may be there and to bring them back into formal financial services uh, it will have to be calibrated very well because our journey right now english and hindi journey is you know uh, uh, pretty well on its way i think the entire language suite that we will need for these cities uh, uh, or towns 
uh, will have to be accelerated because you you may you will have to connect with the customer in the way she wants to connect with you and the second part is that it's definitely over for broadcast i think prasad covered that it's you can't just broadcast things to the customer it has to be two way and that's what is going to be very very important so our voice bots we have a voice bot uh, uh, you know kea the Kotak uh, voice bot and she handles queries and where a specialist is required, there's a, you know, handover to the, you know, to the customer service representative. But, you know, as you use the voice bot, we all know that she gets better at it. So the technology uh, will have to uh, mature, will have to go through its, uh, you know, it'll have to run its course. And then we will have to develop, uh, uh, you know, language capabilities uh, in, in multiple languages to be able to actually talk to everyone. So it's going to uh, have, uh, all of these things are going to have a play. Uh, the, the other aspects of voice really is that it also is unique to you, like your retina or your fingerprint, it is unique to you. So it can actually serve as a, a biometric uh, uh, method as well. So that will, uh, that will see some uh, traction. Uh, the thing is that with financial services, it's always, it's your money. So it's the, it's, it really has to, it's, it's a little different. The consumer mindset is a little different from just buying something, uh, or, um, you know, or doing something like that. So there will be certain level of uh, extended inertia or barrier or concern. Uh, which we will need to uh, address from a financial services perspective. So I think increasingly trust uh, in, in our sector is going to be important because you can't see a person and you can't see a branch, then I need to trust you. So the role of a brand custodian is going and very important for marketers will need to be, uh, will, will become very, very different and will play a very, very important role in the years uh, going ahead. I think we're up for exciting times. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you are going to see IoT. I think Prasad already touched on AI. And as devices uh, talk to devices and people will talk to devices, uh, you know, all with, uh, uh, with voice as well. And that's going to play a very large role in the way things shape up uh, in, in the next few years. So, um, yes, I think BFSI is, is, is making tremendous progress. But in the area of, uh, uh, you know, connecting uh, with the tier three to tier five, using voice and vernacular is going to now unfold at a fairly accelerated pace. And I think everybody's looking at it and everybody's evaluating it. And, you know, it's all for us to see. Absolutely. I think it's going to be a huge game changer. I think we all saw it coming. And, you know, I think it's just kind of really because of all what has happened, it's just kind of really it has sped up the whole thing. And I think that language suite that you spoke about, that will really be another layer, you know, because it really kind of gets so many people interested in it. And the, one of the most interesting things I see is that people have now become very comfortable talking to a chatbot, which was like a very reluctance earlier, but now people are okay to do that, you know, because the times are such, so you, you have to overall kind of, you know, get there. And I think it's a very critical job a banking sector does, because as you said, it's all really about trust and it's their money, you know. So uh, thanks for amazing insights on that. Uh, moving on, uh, my question is to Praval. What are your thoughts on redefining marketing impact amidst this crisis? Zoho has made significant changes uh, to their marketing strategies during the pandemic. So how has marketing been evolving for you in the past year? I mean, specifically in the light of what has happened during COVID. Sure, uh, Vira. In fact, uh, this reminds me of the time when I believe first week of March, when we were starting to see the, the waves coming into India uh, and, and the pandemic. And uh, we were about 8,000, 8,500 8, people then as a company and a company that has never uh, worked remotely, you know, uh, or in this distributed manner for that, for, for that, for any definition of remote work that it is. Most people were in a single office, even though we had offices elsewhere. So uh, back then, I think, um, it was a, a, a brave move to call everybody to sort of make sure that they work from home from tomorrow or within three days. And that was, I think, a few weeks where we were like figuring things out and taking it one day, one week, and then one month at a time and how things play out, like most of us, I would say. Uh, but then uh, we went uh, to work from home more a couple of weeks before the country went into a lockdown. 
and yeah. we were sort of trying to ease into it. And of course, it impacted every department, every function, every individual, uh, including marketing, I would say. And uh, the first thing that we sort of decided and committed to was uh, we would go with this whole method of uh, survive and serve, uh, which is to what, what airlines tell you to wear your own masks first before you help others. So we, we decided that we'll, we'll focus on surviving and then serving, and that led to cutting down of our budgets on, on ads and things like that. And then sort of realigning ourselves and then focusing a lot more on content and education and, and that kind of thing. And uh, that came in from the whole idea of spending more judiciously for now until things start to look better. Uh, the good news for us was uh, things didn't hit us as bad as we thought it would, they may, you know. And uh, so we started opening up our investments again slowly and gradually, but, but in, in a very cautious manner where we said, uh, let's sort of focus on the message, the content, the education that we can create, how we can create value for our prospects and customers and, and less on running ads. And uh, that also led to a few other things, you know, for example, uh, we end up reviewing all of our messages and, and flows on how do we make sure that um, there is uh, enough empathy in our communication that and, and we are mindful of what the world is, is going through and, and not be tone deaf and, and push something uh, you know, towards a prospect or customer. So there's a lot of review around uh, empathy in communication. And then we came up with some programs and initiatives to help small businesses that were facing all the heat, you know, where they were country specific, region specific programs. Uh, for example, in India, we did something called Sudeshi Sankalp to help small businesses, NGOs and government institutions. And, and then we did some, uh, some other stuff in some other countries and so on and so forth. Um, so that was sort of how we sort of uh, held ourselves together and focused on content education and, and let that lead marketing as a function. Uh, also, there was a lot of learning, I would say. You know, one thing was over these months and now more than a year, you know, we've learned that virtual is going to stay, you know, in fact, it's le leaning towards going hybrid, if at all, not off virtual completely. And not just in terms of how we work as a team, as a marketing team or, or as a company, but also how we engage with our prospects, with our customers across sales, marketing, community building, all that. You know, a lot of that we were doing was also happening offline and, and all that changed to virtual and we're now seeing some of it moving towards hybrid. You know, and and uh, and that would change a lot of things. That would uh, potentially bring down business travel. That would potentially redefine how you engage with the prospect, uh, prospective customer in a different part of the world, so on and so forth. Right. So that was one learning, and we are trying to sort of align ourselves with that. The other is uh, we we also saw how content consumption patterns evolved and changed. Right. All the way from voice-based networks like Twitter Spaces and Clubhouse and so on and so forth and how people started spending time on them, you know, and, and all the way to OTTs and, and videos and all that, right? Now, as a marketer uh, and as, a mar as marketing teams, you know, uh, of course, it's our natural inclination towards understanding these newer networks and, and uh, what's the intent of people when they're there, how can we engage with them, how can we be useful? So these are some newer areas I would say we're, we're still tapping on, but, uh, these are all led, I would say, by the pandemic, you know, in terms of how we are re reinventing ourselves. And um, yeah, that's, that's, that's how I would say we've, we've sort of dealt with the last 12, 15, 18 months. Yeah. Thank you, Prabhu. In fact, your uh, uh, the support and the initiative that you guys had done for this Sadeshi Sankal for the small business, I think it was a very, uh, it was a very valuable one. I think it, it made a lot of noise around this and, you know, like a great initiative. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, amazing uh, feedback you've heard on that one. And I, what I hear is that I think you, know, you changed the language, uh, you know, people, you know, a lot of empathy. You know, these are very small things, but I think it makes so much of difference because people are not really in that mindset. And you know, if you change the tone of the whole communication, it really, you really kind of begin to connect with them. So I think those were very uh, like good learnings. And of course, even the hybrid piece, uh, we all know it's a reality. And I think a lot of companies are already beginning to kind of get there, you know, because it's, of course, like it's going to stay. So uh, thanks a lot for those insights. Uh, moving on, uh, my next question is to uh, Prasad. So with the situation, uh, this is again about uh, the whole pandemic. And uh, so with the situation over the past two to three months, uh, what were some of the unique strategies 
the logics of as an agency had to implement for their client amidst the crisis. And I'm talking about mostly for the second wave because of course there are a lot of learning which also came in the first wave, but was it same or did it change? What happened? Yeah, uh, definitely. I think interesting question. I'll cover that. But uh, one thing, uh, what Elizabeth talked about, it really triggered my thought process. Okay, because the voice one that you talk about, voice notes, okay, with collaboration is not, you know, face to face is not happening. So I see, okay, because written words doesn't have tone. So a simple yes, the way I said it can make a lot of different. So I see now, okay, trust me, you call because you said there are tier three and tier four and you know, people who are not educated using voice notes. I start, I have started using voice notes a lot. It is a longer thing to talk about. You just press it and say that, yeah, you should be doing it. I think so. Tack. Okay, instead of, because you know, tone, I just, just say it's a very interesting one because when you are saying it, I was reflecting it. Why do I do it? Right. Okay. Just, uh, I thought of saying it because you know, the whole tone as a concept is no, so sir. critical critical when you are interacting and especially the people who have just got onto our internet that tier two, tier three, tier four, tier five, whatever we're talking about in their language with that tone, when they have to, you know, they are again, you know, the good part is that trusting this medium is very critical. The tone is one of the most important voice uh, attribute, uh, which is uh, okay. But coming back to your question, you know what, to be very frank, second wave is very different, very different. There are many parameters. I still, you know, there are so many parameters that I'm trying to sort of understand and all. But I think what under underlying and of course at the same time, there are a lot of changes happening in the technology space also. You know, we, all of us are aware, you know, in a few months down the line, uh, third party cookies are not going to be there. Your frequency, your audiences, your uh, you know, measurements, everything is going to get affected. But there are four, it's, you know, uh, 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 you know, the, at the end of first uh, sort of wave um, uh, and uh, opening which had happened, a uh, very distinctive cheese happened at, at the thing happened is about data. So, you know, there are whole amalgamation and integration between media creative data insights, uh, you know, um, uh, and technology is being talked about. Okay. And that is becoming enhanced a lot. Okay. So how do I get uh, a lot of different things together and make a campaign? Okay. And understand data from it and do something else. Okay. That's something I see a lot. For example, there is a very simple campaign. You, you asked me what we, there's a okay, very, very simple one. Okay. But a lot of audience based ones. So, you know, what, for one of the large uh, brand, what we did is that combination of, of digital out of home plus, you know, programmatic plus airlines data. Right. So if you're sitting at a, uh, at a, at a, at a gate number two, which is flight is going to Delhi. Okay. Uh, at the DOH, Okay, can you show something different to those audiences? Right? So the whole story of audiences, intelligence mapping, archetypes, you know, all the stuff is coming. Okay, it's not going to be very cut saying that, you know, this channel, that stuff, this KPI. A combination of integration is happening. Having said so, second wave is very different. Okay, I still have not figured out how, how it will be. Uh, things are coming back a bit. As a person, I think I realize, you know, all of us have changed a lot in this last, you know, the second wave. What a reason, multiple things. Uh, but uh, I hope I answered it a little bit in whatever I could. It was not a full answer because I'm still trying to figure out. But it's, a, it's an integrated way of things, uh, uh, which, and in a combination of two or three things could be a major thing stuff there. Yeah. No, I agree because, it's, you know, it's fine because think about it this way. Uh, you know, all people, you know, even if you're a manager in some company or, you know, you are still a human at the end of the day. So, you know, we are all equally impacted. We have seen so much of, you know, death and tragedy happening. You you do start to kind of, you know, some of this does seep into your work as well. So, yes, I mean, that's okay. I mean, you know, as we kind of, you know, the final answer bakes in, we'll probably get to hear from you a little bit more about it later. Uh, uh, thanks a lot, Prasad. Moving on, uh, my next question is to Rubina. How has the definition of ROI changed in the recent times across industry verticals? You are across a lot of um, clients, so you know it could be a different kind of a learning. What, according to you, is the best way to align ROI goals with pertinent marketing channels? So, uh, Rina, this is always an interesting uh, question uh, because, see, at the end of the day, the digital industry is still very new. And, you know, uh, what really delighted marketeers in, uh, and what attracted them through the digital industry in the first place was the fact that, you know, there are so many metrics that you can track. 
But I think also the biggest pitfall is not knowing which is the right metric to track. And that's the biggest pitfall that marketers can fall into, right? Initially, when we started off uh, as an industry, everybody knows, you know, people went for those uh, superficial uh, metrics, uh, vanity ones, which had very little substance. I think, but as um, uh, time has evolved, marketers have also evolved and they're looking at more business intelligent metrics. What these business intelligent metrics are is they, they tell you, um, you know, so basically the idea is really to focus on metrics which tell you what to do next with them. So if you look at a metric and you're not sure, um, you know, how you can uh, use it to make a well-informed decision, then I would just say ditch that metric. It doesn't really matter. Uh, you know, the metrics today have to be far more intelligent and actionable. So how do you decide whether the metric is actionable or not? I, uh, I use basically uh, a, a very simple uh, a way of deciding that, saying that, you know, these are the three questions. If the metric answers any one of those three, then, you know, that's a metric I want to chase. The first one is that, uh, does it help me build, you know, understand whether I'm building or losing my revenue? Does it help me understand whether I'm gaining or losing customers? Or does it help drive people to me, you know, as a marketer? And then on these actionable metrics, then you know, you've got to put in smart KPIs. Now, how do you decide KPIs uh, for each of the channels, et cetera? Again, depends organization to organization. It's very hard to say there's one way of doing it. In some organizations, which are far more integrated, you know, you can have uh, business goals as the KPIs, while in larger organizations where they're structured differently uh, with different teams handling different part of the business, then I think you have to look at uh, KPIs depending on uh, each of the channels that uh, you are using. Um, and to do that, um, you know, we apply something which we call the uh, race framework. And in that, what we do is, um, you know, we look at the, um, we structure the objectives uh, by the customer lifestyle, uh, life cycle stage, you know. Um, so, and then we start looking at it in a very, the KPIs as well as the customer centric data in a very granular way, uh, you know, through the marketing strategy and through that whole journey of uh, reach, act, convert and engage. And obviously through this journey, um, uh, you know, different uh, um, uh, objectives will have different uh, KPIs. Obviously, you know, uh, prospecting will have a different KPI, retargeting will have a different KPI, et cetera, et cetera. So I think uh, that's really the trick uh, currently that we use with our customers. Thanks, Ravina. It looks like almost that you gave away the secret sauce because you know it, it's just like you know that that three question is like really like a great way to look at it. You know if it's going to work for you or not. This is really fantastic. Thanks for that insight. Uh, moving on to uh, Shreyans, uh, let let's hear something from the e-commerce industry now. So e-commerce has witnessed a significant change and uh, growth curve in the past year or so. I'm again talking about with the whole uh, COVID situation. What kind of fundamental impact did that have on Flipkart's focus on marketing performance and goals? Did that change for you guys? Was it same? What happened? Sure. Thanks for the question. So this uh, pandemic, right? It has taught a lot to each of our marketeers, right? So this is a complex world and it's always crowded with so many marketeers coming in, bidding for a single impression, right? And think of a world where there's no one who is ready to pay any money for advertising. Everything is available and it is available at a cost which you want. Right? This is an advertiser's dream situation where you can advertise, but you don't really want to advertise because uh, of multiple reasons. Right? Like a simple example, which I would give on our campaigns, Right? we would have structured our campaigns into a pan India campaign and we would run a pan India campaign or certain transactions. Right? Now in a regular situation, it really works fine. And it uh, kind of gives us the ROI where we are able to shift our monies from a converting, high converting to a low converting to a high converting geography automatically based on algorithms and stuff, right? Now uh, think of a situation where uh, this is changing and it is pretty dynamic in nature, right? Your top converting city is in lockdown and uh, you cannot advertise, right? And your algorithm has gone crazy right now because this is not working anymore. Now, what do you do? Like either you look at a complete restructuring of your account and then you go back and see, okay, this is what, how it is figuring out. Then that's of course, very, very manual, right? So for us, I think uh, the goals kept changing uh, because of this. And uh, as and when cities were going into lockdown or as and when cities were coming out of lockdown, right? We had to be very, very dynamic and swift in sort of uh, advertising the right 
products to the right customer and uh, holding on to your advertising is also very very difficult because when uh, we rely a lot on our first party data right for to uh, go out and advertise on the uh, performance marketing side of things and uh, the problem with first party data is that uh, you you would not want to overuse it but you would want to use it to a extent where you you can just sharpen your advertising campaigns further so the fundamental change which came in right was on how we are buying media what kind of media are we buying right today uh, if you look at search right uh, there is no definition which says that you should buy search only for performance right uh, you can buy search for branding as well and people are out there doing that where search is being used for branding right so it is bit of a uh, tricky situation where you'll have to figure out what what is working for you and how your goals are also changing and you also sort of evolve immediately with the changing ecosystem out there thank you because uh, thank you for speaking about the search for branding part that is something we have also been really pushing because that's almost like trying to change the behavior of the media buyer a uh, typically search kind of always qualifies in the lower funnel but this is a narrative that we have also been trying to kind of work on and uh, yeah i mean you know uh, we have all kind of you know seen how e-commerce has kind of performed and uh, the learning that i wanted to kind of get was that you know i mean it, it does look like uh, all good from out but you know there are so many things that a brand kind of goes through you have to realign so many things internally to kind of deliver a uh, same uh, kind of a result so with that i think we have come to the end of the panel discussion i do have uh, one question and i would love to ask that and uh, this question is uh, that i can go like one, one by one so which is that one book that you feel is a must read for your audience out there and this book does not have to be a business book or whatever but just uh, uh, a book that you really thought it changed you so shayan i could start with you you let me know what do you what do you think is the book that really you thought it's like a really a must read men are from mars and women are from venus that that's like a very very interesting book i think if uh, anyone should uh, if if you get time you should definitely uh, get that onto your first reading list awesome thanks a lot ashans i can ask uh, rubina do you want to tell us about the book you would you, you would want people to read yeah unfortunately it's not published yet i'm okay. a very proud mother <laughs> my daughter's writing it so i've got to promote it yes that's what i've got to encourage everybody my 8 year old daughter is writing a book on uh, her lockdown experience i've got to definitely ask everybody to read but on a more serious note uh, i think uh, if you haven't read the secret i think um, it's a great book It gives you a lot of uh, positivity in your life especially in these uh, tough times so i would encourage those who haven't read it to uh, grab a copy and read thank you rubina Elizabeth, uh, do you want to tell us about a book? Do you want to suggest a book we all should be reading? Yeah, I think that uh, for all women around you, uh, you know, whether it uh, the especially the young younger one, younger women, I think becoming is what I've been gifting to all my Gen Z, uh, all my my daughter as well. I gifted it to her, and uh, I've gifted it to many Gen Z uh, women. I think it's a beautiful story and it's it's inspiring and I think you should read it. Absolutely thanks a lot I'm just, I'm going to read it too this sounds great thanks a lot for sharing that. Uh Pravel do you want to tell us about the book you would want to recommend us to read? Yeah uh, one of the early ones I remember and I it still sort of stuck with me is uh, a book uh, named Siddharth by Harman Hesse and uh, it's it's a very simple book and essentially sort of sits on the principle that Uh, when you're up, when you when you're trying to climb up a mountain, no matter which path you take, when you're up there, the view is pretty much the same, regardless of where you came from, right? That's the sort of uh, a very close, uh, you know, sort of sticks in your mind and, and head for for years. At least it stuck in mind. A friend of mine recommended that. It's a beautiful read. So that's that's something that I I really remember a lot about. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, uh, Prasad. Do you want to tell us? I have the last one. Okay. So I, I yeah i think interesting and it's very difficult because i know rina you know the horacious reader uh, you know every year i read sort of more than 50 odd books okay uh, and multiple genres of stuff but i think one book uh, that i think i will everyone i will ask to read is be uh, anti fragile okay so i think things uh, that gain from a uh, disorder okay so it's it's the book by um, um, nasim athalib okay uh, the whole thing is that the opposite of fragile okay is not strong 
okay something which gains strength on disorder is antifragile very interesting concept and actually um, you know very close to my heart and actually uh, some of this concept are really used uh, during the covid times okay what are the things that we should build okay when there is a shock okay the outcome is not i survived the outcome is that i became strong awesome what is the name of the book you said anti fragile okay by uh, okay anti fragile by i mean it's a it's a things that gain from disorder uh, it's a book by uh, talib uh, okay the same guy who who, who talked uh, talked about uh, black swan th- concepts yeah. right okay a good 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 one um, really good one okay. awesome. very interesting thank you so i think with that we have come to the end of this panel discussion yes and uh, you know this has been lovely talking to you guys and once again um, you know gratitude from my side uh, to thank you thank, thank you. you so much reena for steering this very interesting conversation and thank you to all our panelists we did run a little over time but thank you we had such great recommendations and insights from all of you so thank you so much for your time and being here on this platform thank you so much thank you, thank you very much thank you so much bye